thank you so much for coming. And uh, the lineup that we have for you tonight, I think, is quite extraordinary. We have Dan Gerke, who is our first presenter with A Mentored Life. I've known Dan for quite some time now, and uh, the information that he brings on an informal basis as well as a formal basis has been quite eye-opening to me, and I believe that you're going to get quite a kick out of some of the information that he's got for you tonight. Uh, as well, we have Yarek, who is what the REIC, he is one of our sponsors tonight, we're very grateful to him. For our uh, refreshments after the fact, he'll be providing some coffee upstairs for our networking event after this uh, uh, presentations are over. We have uh, Lori and Miriam who are doing the net wealth presentation. Uh, we'll be hearing a little bit more from my introduction to them later on, as well as uh, the fair the uh, residences at Fairmont Ridge. Tim Turon cannot be with us tonight. Very late cancellation. Uh, but he is a, the owner of the Fairmont Ridge uh, or, uh, organization and uh, condos. And if you get an opportunity to uh, have a look at the booth, uh, you might want to check it out because it's a great, fantastic little weekend getaway for $299 to go and hear their 15-20 uh, minute presentation on how to become a fractional owner on a uh, piece of property where there's golfing and skiing and all kinds of wonderful cool stuff. Uh, only three hours away from town. Uh, let's see, what am I forgetting here? We have, uh, oh yes, October 26 and 28, we actually have an, uh, a, uh, a chef in the mountains. Great weekend planned with the wine and cheese on Friday night. Saturday night is the chef from a local restaurant in town from scratch cooking. Um, cooking with the guests. Passes to the hot springs are $2.99. In the entire weekend is $2.99 for the entire weekend. Uh, if you'd like to uh, see what the information is on that, we have a little showcase table at the uh, in the foyer there. After the fact uh, of our presentations tonight, I'll be sitting there giving information. If you'd like to chat with me about that, um, we'll be having a short break in between each of the speakers. Uh, smoke and uh, pee break. <laughs> <laughs> Only because Cheryl's here. Those are separate events, right? <laughs> <laughs> I do want to make clarification on that. They are separate events. Um, the next event that we'll be holding here is November the 26th. Uh, there will be different speakers, and we'll be updating everyone who is on our email list. <coughs> Um, we're going to be doing some networking, as I mentioned, after the fact. And if you have any questions for our speakers, they're available in the lobby after the event. And so we are now currently at the point where I'll introduce uh, our first speaker, who is speaking on a mentored life with the idea that Dan Gerke, who is... I'm sorry, go ahead, tell me what. And Chris Barillo from Pinnacle Equities. <laughs> so we have three speakers, Dan, uh, Lori and Miriam, and Chris Barillo from Pinnacle Equities. Uh, let's see, so Dan, um, a mentored life. Uh, he has a, a long history of being a researcher and a, a uh, putting information together for people on what uh, assets are toxic and what, uh, what true asset wealth building is and how you can benefit from that. I've heard Dan on a number of occasions here and the information that he has, I have personally done due diligence on my <coughs> personal first-hand experience that everything he's about to share with you tonight is of the utmost top-notch truth. And it is a little bit uh, out there, but it's only because we haven't been educated on these things in the past and I invite you now to take notes and listen to what Dan has to say because these things are, are very important and I believe that you'll get a kick out of them as, uh, as well as Dan has a great presentation. So let's give a warm Calgary welcome, Dan Gerke. Good evening everyone, thank you very much Rick for that introduction. I appreciate all of you coming out on our first snowy day of the year, unfortunately. Um, 
As Rick mentioned, my name is Dan Gerke. I'm the founder of A Mentored Life. And for a little over 20 years now, I've been an investor and a student of, of how money works. But it's in the last, I want to say, three or four years that I've come to the realization that we've all really been lied to about how money actually works. And so now I'm on a bit of a crusade to help as many people as I can to learn some of the principles that I've learned and how to apply them to avoid some of those toxic assets that are out there and how to build true wealth for themselves and their families. So I know there's a few familiar faces in the room. Some of you know who I am. Many of you may not. And, uh, and then there's maybe a few of you in the room who are thinking to yourself, I've seen this guy somewhere before and where do I know him from? So I'll, I'll jog your memory a little bit. While that's up there, just a quick disclaimer. What I'm sharing tonight, I'm not, I'm not a financial planner. I'm not an insurance salesman, a, a mutual fund salesman. So please do your own due diligence on everything. Uh, I want to share the information, but I want you to be informed for yourself. And that's essentially what that's saying. We had some technical difficulties, so I just have to flip out of this presentation to get the video to show. Bear with me. There we go. That's quiet out there, isn't it? Yeah. Where's our Cardell guy? Yeah. Your battery's low. <laughs> 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 oh, I would give you that valuation. I can't believe you had the sheer balls to come out. Here, let me back that up. Yeah, I think you got sound now. You guys hear out there at all? Yeah. is actually just a reminder to myself that if I can stand up there and do that, this is a piece of cake. <laughs> but in all seriousness, that, that, that event, that opportunity for me was one of those chances that unfortunately I wasn't well prepared for. And the opportunity came and went and I didn't make the best of it. So it's a reminder to me, well now we lost everything. Wow. Um, the guy's on the job, so that's good. Uh, it's a reminder to me to make the best of all my opportunities. And so tonight I'm going to share with you what I feel is one of the greatest opportunities we'll ever see in our lifetimes. And it's only the people that are prepared that are going to actually benefit from this opportunity. Are we almost there? So what we're going to talk about tonight, actually, is, is uh, Kevin O'Leary from the Dragon Den. His favorite subject, and you know, you might have seen him sitting there doing this and saying, "Money." And unfortunately, what most of us know as money isn't really what I found out money is. And in a lot of cases, what we think is money turns out to be toxic paper assets. There we go. All right, so if we go back far enough in time, before money existed, we, we conducted trade on a barter system. I'd take my goat and I'd go and find somebody that had potatoes willing to trade. And hopefully they wanted a goat for their potatoes. If not, then I was out of luck or, or I had to go find somebody with chickens, which is what he wanted in the first place. And it was a very cumbersome system. So then we evolved and we started using 
different forms of money. We started using shells and beads and grains and salt and all kinds of different things as money. And eventually it progressed to where we were using precious metals because they had intrinsic value. They could be minted into uh, standard denominations. And that was a very stable system for us to use. The challenge with using gold primarily as money was packing around a big bag of gold was heavy and cumbersome. So the first banks of our time were actually the goldsmiths. And what they enabled us to do was to go in, deposit our gold, and they'd give us a receipt, a piece of paper with the amount of gold we had on deposit. And people found these paper receipts to be very, very convenient. They could actually trade their receipt for goods rather than going into the bank and trading their receipt for gold and then taking their gold to go buy something. So that became the first form of paper money, is these receipts from the banks. What happened over time, though, is, is the, the bankers realized, well, you know what, I've got all this gold in the vault, and I've handed out paper, equivalent amounts of paper, but what are the odds that everybody's going to show up today and want their gold? Slim to none? So they figured, well, if everybody's not coming for their gold today, why don't we just issue a few more receipts? That'll put more money out there. That'll spur the economy. People will be able to buy more goods. And that's what happened. More receipts were issued, more notes or more certificates were issued than gold was sitting in a vault. And for the short term, it actually was great for the economy. Because now people could buy more goods. Now, because of that though, the price of goods went up with the amount of money in circulation. And it escalated to a point where all the costs of everything started going through the roof. And we know that as inflation. And inflation isn't really just that the cost of goods go up because demand increases. It's because the value of the money buying those goods decreases. And it works good to a point in time until, until the people that have those receipts in their pockets, they lose faith in their ability to go into the bank and exchange their receipt for gold. And a bank run occurs. And essentially, this photo is probably from back in the 30s. A bank run, people went to the bank demanding their gold for their paper receipts, and the bank doesn't have the gold on hand. They've issued more paper than they have gold. The bank collapses, and people are left without anything in, in return. And that's the system that, that has existed over the centuries and it has repeated over and over. And we're in a similar situation now. And tonight I'm going to share with you why I think a lot of the paper assets that are out there are toxic and then what we can do about it. Where, where the rays of hope are in the doom and gloom. So I'm sure most of you have gone to the grocery store and noticed that your dollars don't go quite as far as they used to. <clears throat> and this is the reason why. This is a, a dollar, Canadian dollar in 1971. And if you follow it all the way down to, it ends in 2009, this particular chart. But basically a dollar today will get you about eight cents worth in 1971 dollars. Our dollar has been devalued by this, which is the currency in circulation. In simple terms, your money just doesn't go as far as it used to. Who can tell me in 2008 what triggered this, the big stock market crash, in almost this time of year in 2008, four years ago now? The credit crunch. What? triggered the credit crunch. The prime mortgage. That's the one. So, the subprime mortgage issue down in the States. Essentially, the, the housing industry there was built on false fundamentals. People were getting loans that shouldn't have had loans in the first place. If you could fog a mirror, you could get a mortgage. And this house of cards escalated to the point where subprime mortgages which have a low teaser rate introductory rate for a short period of time and then they reset to adjust to a new rate well when those mortgages all reset that's when the foreclosures started happening and once that happened 
those toxic paper assets caused the, the financial crisis that we've all been feeling for four years. This is a long quote. Um, tell me at the back if you can read that, or if you prefer I read it out to you. You can see it okay? Yep. <clears throat> and it's from 1924, but I think it's still pretty applicable today. Things haven't changed much, unfortunately. The bank system that's in place that allowed those subprime mortgages was because the banks knew that they could make bigger profits by lending more money. That's how banks make money. And they continue to do that to a point where people lost their homes and that wealth transferred. It didn't disappear, it transferred. Everybody got that okay? So it's kind of scary, but it's there. So this is that drop in 2008. And if we know that that was triggered by a subprime housing crisis, what might happen today if we had a similar situation? If there were more foreclosures on the books, if there were more similar style mortgages to the subprime mortgages that are all resetting right now, do you think the markets would react in a similar fashion? Absolutely. Any guesses? Yeah. <clears throat> this big green section here, this is a chart from the IMF on mortgage products that are out there. So that section over there, that's the subprime mortgages that all reset in 2007, 2008. <clears throat> this is fairly light, you can't see it very good, but that's another segment of similar type mortgages that are all resetting. They started resetting in 2011. So if we know what happened in 2008 because of stuff that started resetting in 2007, What's going to happen now? And that's, that's the first primary indicator that there's toxic assets out there and maybe paper assets aren't your best place to be. Now there's, to my knowledge, there's been three presidents in the U.S. that spoke out about the banking system and there's three presidents have been, that have been assassinated. And I'm not going to draw conclusions, I'll let you draw your own. But this is one of the men who spoke out against that system. And this quote was two weeks before he was assassinated. How many people here know the name Rothschild? Is that familiar to anybody? That family is fairly prominent in the banking world. And this is an old quote from the senior Rothschild. <clears throat> Basically he's saying that give him control of the money, it doesn't matter what the laws are, he can do what he likes. And unfortunately I think that's played out. The second factor I'm going to talk about is debt. Now we're all familiar with debt, I'm sure to some degree we've all had some or still carry some. The thing that's different this time around from previous similar eras. The United States is currently the reserve currency on the planet. Basically what that means is that the money that's used for all international trade, the, the, the currency that all other currencies are measured against is the US dollar. And it's been in place for almost a century now, since the end of the Second World War. The difference from when, oops, sorry, back up from when all these other currencies were the reserve currency is that this time around the US currency is a fiat currency. Basically what that means is it's no longer backed by gold. It doesn't have any ties to gold anymore. As of 1971 when Nixon with the stroke of his pen turned the US dollar and effectively the rest of the world into a fiat currency. Now fiat currency is backed by nothing. It's a paper based system it essentially means that that money is backed by the promise of the citizens of the nation to pay the debt. So that means me and that means you to pay back the debt on the dollar. 
So then, since 1971, they've been unhinged from gold. And that's allowed them to print money at will, which they've done. Um, these have gone into hyperinflation throughout history. There's thousands of examples. And the one thing they all have in common is they all fail at some point generally within about 40 years, and 71 to now is just over 40 years, so we're getting due. I, I like this picture. Those aren't blocks of wood or, or bricks that the kids are playing with. Those are stacks of bills from Weimar, Germany. And this one from Zimbabwe, $100 trillion. They went into hyperinflation uh, in 2000 to 2008 and they're still working out uh, what, what they're going to do. They're using different currencies currently. But I like this down here. Mm -hmm. No Zimbabwe dollars in the toilet. They're, they're worth that much, they'll use them as toilet paper. And that's the situation that potentially, if the U.S. keeps printing money like it has been, could happen there as well. And they've been printing money. Now this chart shows you how much they've been printing. It took 84 years for them to put $825 billion in circulation. Now base money is the actual paper or coins that are out there, not, not the zeros in a, on a computer screen, but actual physical dollars in circulation. And then when that crisis hit, they started printing like crazy. And they more than doubled it in two years, and they've almost quadrupled it now the amount of money in circulation. <clears throat> and yet, a lot of that money is still sitting in bank vaults. It hasn't gotten out into circulation where the public is using it. And it's when that happens that we get into inflation and potentially hyperinflation. How many know that the Federal Reserve isn't actually federal? It's no more federal than Federal Express, actually. So. <laughs> It's, it's not federal, it doesn't have reserves, and it's not a bank. It's privately owned. And it's been in place since 1913. It's the central bank of the U.S. Now we talked about trillions, or back on that screen, it was trillions of dollars in circulation. And I don't know what your thoughts are on a trillion, but I can't really wrap my head around what a trillion actually is. So this... this image does a great job of demonstrating it. So this first little stack of bills is a million dollars in hundred dollar bills. And to be honest, I was a little underwhelmed by it. I thought it'd be a bigger pile of money than it is, but it's still a lot of money. hundred million is a single pallet, a billion is ten pallets. This football field sized area is double stacks of hundred dollar bill pallets. That's a trillion dollars. But let's put it in terms we can all understand. So this side of this slide is the U.S. debt in real dollars. This slide is actually a bit old, but it'll work for the example. Let's convert it to something we can all understand. So let's turn it into our family budget. Our family... <coughs> Example of family's income is $21,700 a year. Unfortunately, we have expensive tastes and we spend $38,000 a year. So we put the difference on our credit cards that we've been doing for quite a while. We put another $16,000 on our credit cards. We already had a balance of $142,000 on our credit cards. And when we sit down and look at all that, we think, wow, that's not right. Maybe we should do something about that. So we decide we're going to chop 385 out of our budget for the year. We'll cut back somewhere. So who thinks that's a sound fiscal policy? That that's going to work? How long are we going to survive on a, on a budget like that? Well, unfortunately, that's, that's the system that's in place worldwide right now. We're seeing it in Europe. Greece, Spain, Italy, Portugal, Ireland, Iceland went through it. This, this is global. And one thing I want to point out, I have been talking a lot about the U.S. And the reason I do is because, for one, it's the global currency. It's the reserve currency on the planet. 
But the other big thing about that is that because it's the reserve currency, everything it does affects the rest of the planet. We're all tied to it. Um, here in Canada, we may be isolated a little bit from it, but we're attached at the hip to the U.S. You've heard the expression, when they sneeze, we catch a cold. What goes on down there happens here, whether we like it or not. And we're operating on a very similar system. Henry Ford, uh, everybody knows that name, but they probably aren't aware of his comments almost a century ago. <laughs> So I like to think that by everybody being out here tonight, we kind of are starting a revolution because it's the opening of the eyes to what's going on that's going to help us get through this period. Now the third factor is the baby boomers. Now my parents are baby boomers. Um, they are a year or two away from retirement. And for the baby boomers that may be in the room or any of you that know them, what have the baby boomers been doing for 50 years? Spending working. money. Yeah. They've been working, they've been spending, they've been saving. And they've been this huge demographic that has moved industry all through their lives. And now what are they doing? They're retiring. And what are they going to retire on? Selling their assets. Selling their assets. If they have. Them. A lot of them have been saving in the stock markets, in GICs, in bank products. And now they're going to start to retire and they need that money to live on. So for round numbers, if there's 75 million baby boomers just in the U.S., we'll just use that as an example. And they pull $1,000 a month to live on out of their retirement account. And then they collect another thousand from the government, uh, their pension plan, whatever they happen to have. So that's two thousand a month to live on. Uh, that should pay their bills, pay for food. Maybe they'll get to travel a little bit. Two thousand dollars isn't extravagant, but that equates to one hundred and fifty billion dollars a month coming out of the markets. And I can't imagine a scenario where that will drive the markets up if all that money's coming out. So that's a lot of doom and gloom. Wasn't too cheery. So now I'd like to present some opportunities that are out there. We've, we've seen some of the causes. Now let's learn what we can do with them to benefit. And the nice thing is that I mentioned earlier, money doesn't disappear, it transfers. And right now it's transferring faster than it ever has before. And it's transferring from the people that are educated, sorry, from the people that are uneducated to the people that are educated. The people that are prepared are getting the benefits from the people that are unprepared. So we all know the depression. We've heard about the depression as being this time of unemployment and food lines and all those kinds of things. But what we don't know is that that period produced more millionaires than any time in history. Again, because that money transferred. It went from the masses to the few. <laughs> and then you get that scenario. So, where are the opportunities? What are the ray of hope opportunities that are out there? And number one is gold and silver. Now, I talked about gold and silver at the very start. Gold and silver have been stable through centuries, forever. In fact, if you had a gold coin today, you could walk into a, a men's clothing store and buy the same thing today you could have done if you were in Roman times. In Roman times, you'd get a pair of sandals, a nice toga, and a belt. Today, you'll get a nice pair of shoes, a fine suit, and a belt. It's still the same value as it was. Now, it doesn't seem like it right now when you look at what the price of gold is. But the thing about that is that the price is based on the paper dollars that you need to buy that gold. The actual intrinsic value of the gold hasn't changed for centuries, and it stays the same. But in periods like this, everybody flocks back to precious metals, and that drives the value up temporarily. So physical gold and silver are excellent opportunities right now. Even though gold is reaching historic highs, 
uh, I firmly believe there's a still a long ways to go before gold finishes its run, and silver even more so. Um, from when I gave this presentation, not quite two months ago, silver's gone up 20% just in the last two months, and it's starting to move again. Um, it now. Back in 2008, summer of 2008, I'll just give you a, a brief story about how this affected me. In the summer of 2008, I had not one, but three people that I respected tell me to get out of the market, buy some silver. And back at that time, silver was trading for about $15 an ounce. And it sounded okay, but I didn't know enough about it to take action. And that was unfortunately a poor decision because in the fall of 2008 I lost about a quarter of my retirement portfolio as a result of leaving it in those toxic paper assets that I have no control over. Physical gold and silver is something you can carry in your pocket, you can put in your safety deposit box, you can keep in your house and in times like Weimar Germany or Zimbabwe's hyperinflation, all those other examples, people will take gold and silver in exchange for their goods. They won't take that paper because the paper is worthless. In fact, they say that once you go into hyperinflation, that the paper that the money's printed on is actually not even worth paper anymore because you can't write on it like a notepad. I mean, it's covered in ink already, so you can't even use it as note paper. It's that worthless. Another thing about gold and silver that I, I want to point out, and gold is, is kind of a historic store of wealth, uh, always has been. In the last little while, silver, which was generally tied to gold, has become an industrial metal. It's used in virtually everything you can think of. It's the best conductor of electricity out there. It's a great conductor of heat. It has antimicrobial properties, so that sewing it in clothes and underwear and sportswear, uh, medical purposes, all these different uses for silver. And it's actually, they're running a deficit on silver right now. They use more than they can pull out of the ground every year. And the historical ratio value of gold to silver runs usually 1 to 15. And the reason for that was there were... Typically, there was 15 times more silver in circulation than gold. So gold was worth 15 times more. Well, the current ratio right now, I uh, checked today, it's closer to 1 to 50. So we're way out of line for the ratio. And because silver is being used and not just hoarded, it, if anything, it'll go the other way. Silver will be closer uh, in value to gold. So it's an excellent opportunity. Its price is at about $35 right now versus gold, which is approaching $1,800. So it's at a price point that everybody can get started with. Now, one thing I want to point out about silver and gold. Uh, people that have invested in silver and gold, a lot of them will buy government-issued coins. <coughs> silver maple leaves, the American Eagles, um, the coins that are are widely recognized are government issue coins. The one downside to that is just like the paper dollars in our wallets is because the government made those coins they actually own them not you. So if they chose which the US did in the 30s to recall the gold it's not yours. You might be the bearer of it but you don't own it. So I would I would encourage seeking out private minted coins if you're going to own gold and silver. And I can certainly talk to you more about that. Now the second opportunity, cash flowing real estate. And I know there's a few people in the room that are, that are in real estate and understand this very well. This is an area that the wealthy are investing in for a couple of reasons. When that foreclosure situation happened in the U.S., do you think people that owned rental properties did well? So, I happen to own a rental property, um, and are there any other people in the room that own a rental property, or more than one? Anybody a renter in the room? No renters? 
want to enter? So it, can I ask you a question? Is that all right? Sure. If your landlord came to you tomorrow and gave you three months or six months or a year's notice or said at the end of your lease, I want my house back, what, what recourse would you have? Do you have any options at that point? Can you stay in the house if he asks you, if he tells you that? And the reason being is that he's the owner, right? He actually owns the property. So that's the benefit of having some rental properties. In a situation where people are, are possibly losing their houses, they're going to want rental properties. And those rental properties are all going to cash flow and pay for themselves. But the big benefit that I see is that you know, if I'm in a situation where I've got one house and for whatever reason I lose my job, I no longer have income, I go into a foreclosure situation, I don't have options. If I've got one other property or maybe a few properties, at least then I've got an option. I still have a place to go. So one of my mentors when I first got into real estate said his biggest lesson, his biggest aha was that his father-in-law was retiring and needed to sell his house so he could live. He couldn't afford, he had a house, but he couldn't afford to buy food or anything else. So he had to sell his house so that he had money. And he told his son-in-law, he said, you know what, if I'd only ever bought one other house in my lifetime, I wouldn't be in this situation. I could sell that second house and still live in my own. So it gives you options. And of course, if it's cash flowing, I mean, people like uh, Kiyosaki have been buying up multifamily uh, rental properties for years because they see that's where things are going. Real estate does typically hold its value. I mean, it, it moves in cycles like everything else. Everything moves in cycles. But real estate over the long term does very well. Now, the third opportunity is other hard assets. And Primarily colored diamonds. And this one's a favorite of mine, actually. And it's one I didn't know anything about less than a year and a half ago. And I've done a ton of due diligence on it. Do you guys happen to know um, if the monarchy, the queen in England, if, if they were overthrown for whatever reason, do you realize that there's a law in the books in the UK that says they can leave with what they can carry? What do you suppose they might carry? The crown jewels. Yeah. There's a good reason they put all those gems in their fancy hats. Yeah, so <coughs> colored diamonds have been a store of wealth for, for centuries, especially in the last 25 years, though. They've, they've, really, uh, they've really become more common and popular. Uh, they were an anomaly prior to that. And there's one thing about them, and for those of you taking notes, here's something to write down. I'm going to give you the dates that the values of colored stones have gone down. Are you ready? Are you ready? There are none. They've actually, in the 25 to 30 years that they've been tracked, colored diamonds have never gone down in value. And they're, they're poised to go up more than ever before right now. For one reason in particular, and it's supply and demand. There's one mine in the world that produces almost all of the pink and the champagne diamonds, and it's closing in a few years because they've mined it out. <coughs> so those are some excellent ray of hope opportunities. But what I'd like to propose to all of you is that the even bigger opportunity is now that you have the information do something with it don't be like me in 2008 and, and hear the advice from trusted advisors and then do nothing with it um, as you'll notice on your handouts I would be more than happy to meet with every one of you sit down for a no cost no obligation consultation and dig into this a little bit further so that's my invitation to you Take the opportunity, take some action, get some more information so that you're informed, do your own due diligence, and do what's right for you, but do something. Uh, please don't stick your head in the sands, because this information is important, I believe everybody should hear it, 
And I believe everybody, once they hear it, will want to know more and want to do something about it. So essentially that's the end of my presentation. I, uh, if anybody has any questions, I will be out in the lobby later. And by all means, come and find me. And, uh, and otherwise, if you'd like to book a time to uh, meet with me, you can see my wife at the table outside and we'll set something up. Thank you very much. Thank you.